guys. Welcome back to another episode here. Just have your ministry for the Casa de Israel. Yaray. Thank you again for being there. Like I always tell you, if you like the content that we're putting up in our channel, like, subscribe. If you have questions, concerns, put them on the comment section down below. So we're going to continue with the Torah portions. But before we do that, we'll do the Torah blessing. Bless Adonai who is blessed, bless Adonai who is blessed now and forever. We bless are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has chosen us from among the peoples and has given us the Torah. Bless are you, Adonai, who gives the Torah. Amen. So, this week's Torah portion is Lech Lecha. So, let's get started. Now, this week's Torah portion starts with Abram. So, we have seen creation, we have seen the blueprint. We have seen how God gave the blueprint to men, the perfection, the order, and men has struggled with maintaining that. And so Elohim restarted with Noah, and we have seen how Elohim accepted Noah because he was unblemished and he was righteous. And we understood that he gave men rest in the beginning, and he gave them the protection that Elohim was the creator. But men has distorted their life and the order that got established to the point where they have lost their way. And so Lech Lecha is established after a, a, a big moment in where men decided they wanted to be like Elohim and they wanted to reach the heavens and they wanted to make a name for themselves. So we're going to look at that perspective and understand it a little bit. And then we're going to understand why Elohim uses the words and the verbiage that he uses with Abraham. Okay. So, let's get started. Lech Lecha. Go for yourself. Go for yourself uh, from your country. And this is what Elohim tells Abram, right? And it's Genesis 12, verse 1, verse 17, verse 27. Uh, the half that I, or the prophet portion is uh, Isaiah 40, verse 27 to Isaiah 41, verse 16. And the New Testament portion of the Brich Hadasha is John chapter 8, verses 51 to 58. And so we understand that before we get to Abraham, there is a story of the Torah portion of Noah of last week, how we saw uh, the Tower of Babel and how men and the descendancy uh, of Noah uh, started to build this tower. And so this is what they said. Now, the whole earth used the same language, the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shina. And settle there. Shinar, the Hebrew term for Shinar, ref refers to the area that ancient Near Eastern texts referred to as Summer or Samaria. It covered the southern part of Tigris and Euphrates, and that is what is called Mesopotamia. And it's called that because it's between those two rivers. The river basin as far north as Zibar, where the rivers converge in the area of modern southern Iraq. Major cities of the region included Kish, Nippur. Shurukpa, Girsu, uh, Uruk, Iridu, and Ur. This is the area where urbanization developed and is the heartland of Mesopotamian civilization. They also said the following Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for our, ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, making a name. The ancient world placed immense value on the sense of continuity from one generation to another. In some cultures, a person continued comfort in the afterlife. It was dependent on one care from descendants in the land of the living. The details often involve memorial meals, which they call kipspu, and various regular uh, mortuary rites, but more basically and more importantly for this passage, all of those rituals provided opportunity for the name of the disease to be spoken. There is continued life and vitality as long as one is remembered. Descendants took on themselves the responsibility more than any other and thus the most reliable way to make a name for oneself was to have children. The living thus for a bridge of continuity between the past ancestors and the future descendants, the core must not 
be broken. They will also fear to be scattered. Now, the fear of scattering is directly related both systematically and conceptually to the previously stated desire to make a name. Remembrance takes place in the vicinity of the burial ground. Descendants who move away, as Abraham does in chapter 12, cut the ties of continuity between the past and the present. When sons move away, no one remains to take care of the elderly parents, to provide proper burial, and to arrange for remembrance. Okay, so they were afraid that whatever they were building and establishing was going to be destroyed and was going to be forgotten if they didn't reach the heavens and made a name for themselves up in heaven. Jim Botero has summarized Mesopotamian religiosity in the following terms. Mesopotamian religiosity was made up above all of a centrifugal feeling of fear, respect, and servility. With regard to the divine, that the divine was portrayed in human model and was separated over a whole society, supernatural beings, gods, whose needs people were expected to fulfill and whose orders were to be carried out with all their devotion, submission, but also generosity and ostentation that were thought to be expected by such lofty figures. Furthermore, it was resultly and exclusively a prehistoric religion without holy scriptures, religious authorities, dogmas, orthodoxy, or orthopraxy, or fanatism. There was two elements to the Mesopotamian mindset, which was the state religion, right? And we're going to speak about the second one in a little bit. But state religion, much of what we know about the religious practice of ancient Near East concerns with what will be called the state religion. This is because most of written documents, primary sources available to us, derive from palaces and temples. Ordinary commoner in the ancient world had little relationship with religion at the level of state, aside from festivals and other spectacle events such as processions. Family religion is the other element. The religion practice at the popular level can be called family religion because it had its basis in the family unit rather than the individual. The nature of polytheism significantly affects the distinction between state and family religion. Since the gods were viewed as operating within a hierarchical system, there was a bureaucracy and a division of labor. While the state religion would be focused primarily on the gods connected to the major temples in the city and particularly the patron god of the city, most families will feel that they had little access to those great gods. Likewise, those gods will not likely be concerned about them or hear their requests. It was not considered obligatory for individuals to worship the state gods and consequently the common people tended to turn to their family and ancestral gods who would more likely take interest in them. This is the mindset that they have. This is what they were experiencing in the time of Abraham in the land where he was uh, growing up and that his father eventually takes him out. And so they have a sense of uh, deities that are dependent on humankind and have images that are dependent on human nature and are supposed to take care of these gods. And we have spoken before about this. They they were created because men had to maintain the gods and they were taking care of what the gods they didn't want to take care. And so Abraham is growing up in a in a society where they wanted to make a name for themselves and they wanted their name to go on to the ends of the earth and be perpetuated in time and so last week we saw that they wanted to create a tower so that they can reach the heavens make a name for themselves and establish themselves so that they are not scattered so that they're not forgotten where we are now is this little picture this little trail and we're following abraham's steps and we're going to understand why elohim addresses abraham the way that he does in the opening verses of this torah portion okay and so we're going to go there. So the story portion opens up with Wayomer Adonai El Abraham Lech Lecha Me'ar Zecha 
ומים מולדך. ומים בית אביך אל הארץ אשר עריך. In English, it says the following. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham went forth as the Lord has spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Now Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham took Sarai his wife and Lot his nephew. All their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. They set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land as far as the site of Sikkim to the Oaks of Moreh. Now the Canaanites was then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now he builds an altar understanding that he's establishing a marker. This is where Adonai told me this. He builds an altar. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give the land. So he built an altar there who, have, who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded there to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now we're going to jump this. This is when Abraham goes to Egypt and he interacts with Pharaoh. But we're going to go jump to chapter 13. It says, Abraham went up to, from uh, Egypt to the Negev. And he and his wife and all the belonged to him and a lot with him. And now Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He went on his journey from Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Now, so remember, it was the marker. He established where Elohim told him. He went to Egypt. There was a famine. Comes back to the same place Elohim promised him. And he called on the name of the Lord. Okay. And now Abraham and Lot are, you know, disputing on, on separating. And Lot decides to go his way. And then the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants of the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through it, its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar, and altar to the Lord. Okay? Now there's the war of kings, where Abraham goes to defend his, uh, his uh, nephew Lot, and he saves him. Right? And so Abraham has an encounter. And he says, Then after his return from the defeat of Kedor Lamer, and the kings who were with him, the kings of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavit, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And now he was a priest of God Most High, and he did a covenantal meal. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, the God of the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God of Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all, and the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me, and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, possessor of the heavens and the earth, that I will not take a thread of the sandal or the thong, or anything that is in yours. For a fear of you will say, I have made Abraham rich, or Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten. And the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eskol, and Mamre. Let them take 
their share. So Abraham here establishes a moral aspect to who he is, right? With the interaction with the king of Sodom. But Elohim is speaking to Abraham in a language that when we see the Mesopotamian mindset, Elohim is telling Abraham, I can be your family God, right? And I will give you descendancy and I will give you a name. But it's interesting because then he says, and I will make you a great nation. And this is the first time where Abraham puts his faith on a God that promises him to be not only his family's God, but the nation's God and that Elohim will be one. There won't be a family God and a state God and then a pantheon of gods. No, it will be one God that will be state and family, understanding the mindset where Abraham is coming from. And so Abraham here is putting his faith on this invisible God. And he has left everything believing that this God will maintain him and sustain him. Okay, now let's finish with chapter 15. Okay, so it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. Understanding that Abraham is 75 years old, okay? And took, and he took him outside and said, Now look at towards the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendant be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he re was reckoned it to him as righteousness. He said, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, and a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a third old dove, and a pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, and cut them in two, and laid each half opposite of the other. But he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Now. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for a hundred years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It came about when the sun set, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river of Euphrates, the Kenite, the Kenizzites, the Kemurite, and the Hittite, the Parasite, and the Raphaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Girgashite, and the Yebusite. So, Elohim, understanding now the, the sacrificial process that went through Abraham now, Elohim makes a statement. He says, I will give you offspring, and the offspring will inherit this land, and your name will be perpetuated through time. And this is what those people in the Tower of Babel and in Mesopotamia desired the most. And so what took the Tower of Babel, the confusion, the distraction, Abraham decided to listen to one voice from heaven. He didn't decide to usurp that position. He understood that if he heard this voice and obeyed it every time, as his consistency grew, Elohim tried him with Melchizedek. He tried him with Lot. He tried him in the beginning saying, if you leave everything, I will guide you and I will give you a land and I will give you descendancy. And Abraham has done this this whole time. He has depended on yod on his Elohim, the invisible one that has promised him many things, but has accomplished protecting him. And so Abraham makes a covenant. But 
as he is doing the sacrificial system and we obviously cannot go into depth of what did that represent to them in that moment in time there's animals specific animals that were requested split in half and there's a trail and so abraham was meant to walk through there but abraham falls asleep and elohim does something very powerful that he does to abraham and he tells us that he by his name he has swore that he will keep his oath not only to abraham but to his descendancy and that his name will be remembered forever that he wouldn't have to worry about his name being forgotten because of because of his obedience because of his faith he had been accepted by Elohim to obtain the gift of the descendancy and the land and the covenant that thanks to Yeshua our Messiah we have access to but it all started with Abraham's faith and Abraham's will to obey an invisible God to follow his voice to trust in him and by him doing that Elohim said that he swore uh, by his name that Abraham's promise will be fulfilled and us talking about this in this video congregating and talking about him is the fulfillment of that and so as long as we can stay consistent we're faithful and we are willing to walk sometimes into the unknown but knowing that we depend on the one true creator should give us peace because he will deliver us to the promise so with that being said i thank you guys for listening hope you guys have a great week see you next week shabbat and shabbat shalom thank you